Our first speaker is Jason Tejada. Jason went to high school in Upper Manhattan, graduated from Columbia, and works for J.P. Morgan Chase. But that's just part of the story. You see, Jason attended Incarnation School on a children's scholarship fund, that remarkable program for some 140,000 students, started by John Walton and Ted Forsman. But wait till you hear his story, as profiled in Naomi Schaefer Riley's new book, Opportunity and Hope. Please welcome Jason Tejada. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I want to thank the Philanthropy Roundtable for affording me the opportunity to stand before you tonight and share my story. I especially want to thank the Children's Scholarship Fund for changing the trajectory of my life more than 14 years ago when I earned their scholarship. Darla, the president of the organization, is here today supporting me. And Darla, I want to say thank you, thank your board, thank your donors, and your staff for giving me and my family opportunity and hope. <clears throat> you see, a majority of my relatives and my parents moved to the United States in the late 80s to create opportunity and hope for the future offspring, my cousins, my sisters, me. It was their dream and their goal to give their children a first-class American education so that their children could become professionals and create a better life. They all came with scarce resources and settled down in areas with affordable rent. These neighborhoods often had high crime rates, drug problems, and deplorable living conditions. One of the hallmarks of America is the right to a public education. My parents did not have the money to send me to a private school, and therefore had no choice but to send their children to public schools. And the way public schools are set up, your zip code determines your, your school, essentially. A quick side story. When my mother enrolled me in school, she wanted to enroll me in the newer public school two blocks north of our home in Washington Heights in Upper Manhattan. However, given our address, she was forced to enroll me in an older public school four blocks south of my home. Thus, my zip code was going to determine my elementary education. And this happens to every student who attends the public school system. Because of my zip code, I was not qualified to start in a newer school building but rather in a school with poor infrastructure and poor performance. This happened to many of my cousins and my friends also. However, there was one salvation for my sister and my education, philanthropy. Hearing of the scholarship opportunity through the Children's Scholarship Fund, my mother immediately applied. We were fortunate to be awarded the scholarships, and my parents were given the ability to choose which educational institution to enroll their children in. They were able to vet out all the private and parochial schools and choose the one they felt was best for my sisters and me. This was the turning point in my life's trajectory. Soon, my sisters and I started a different educational journey. Supported by teachers, embraced by staff, the school we attended, while not the best in condition or with the best resources, created an environment and a culture of expectation, instilling a sense of agency that we needed to succeed our succeed academically, and better our character. The teachers believed in us. The students fed off the energy and persevered through elementary school. Facing the next journey in my life, high school, I applied again to the New York City public school system. The application did not ask for any of my grades or any of my extracurricular activities, but rather just asked for my address and my top seven choices. <clears throat> I was a top performer in school, both academically and on standardized exams but the public school system was going to send me to one of the worst performing high schools in the city. Again, facing the possibility of my educational career being curtailed, I was fortunate to earn another scholarship to attend All Hallows High School in the South Bronx. And I say fortunate because All Hallows ensured that even though I was battling cancer, I transitioned into high school seamlessly. Had I not gone to All Hallows, I would have probably been forced to sit out a couple of years because of cancer. All Hallows drilled me academically, but it also focused on developing me professionally. It developed students holistically, academically, professionally, and spiritually. Hanging out with peers who unfortunately did not have a choice in picking their school, 
I noticed a lack of investment in their school, both in academics and their extracurricular activities. But can you really blame them? Having to go through countless metal detectors, dealing with fatigued faculty and staff, and a system more focused on political prowess than educational excellence for their students. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying all public schools are like this. Many are doing it right. But the, the, story, the true story is, those that are located in below average socioeconomic areas are lagging. Furthermore, as we got to the latter years in high school, my peers were often not readily aware how to build a resume, when to take the SAT, or how to even apply to, to college. They weren't even given the opportunity to take advanced placement college courses. Thankfully, my education at Ohalo's allowed me to earn a full scholarship to Columbia. Attending Columbia allowed an inner city boy to enter a different culture and community, to become exposed to a liberal arts education and a community that is a confluence of different backgrounds, to become exposed to opportunities, resources, and a network that can prove to be invaluable. Yes, philanthropy made this possible. Philanthropy through scholarship allowed me to see what exists beyond the community I grew up in, to see the countless career paths at my disposal, and to broaden my intellectual horizon. But see, and let me make this clear, I am not an anomaly, but rather one of several thousand of examples of how an educational scholarship can change someone's life for the better. The scholarships I received in my life to attend Incarnation, then All Hallows, and later Columbia, paved the way for me to develop myself intellectually and professionally. Because of my scholarships, I had access to professional development workshops and internship at, internships at companies like Bloomberg, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and now I'm starting my career in public finance at Build America Mutual. And the rig rigorous education I received is allowing me to start creating a better life for my family and me, and to drive systemic change in a community that I live in and the organizations I choose to be a part of. See. Philanthropy is contagious, <clears throat> pardon me. I know that without the help of philanthropic individuals like yourselves, I would not have the same experience. Many of us who receive help through philanthropy become phil philanthropic and community volunteers. I now serve on the board at Incarnation, the elementary school where my sisters and I use their children's scholarship fund, scholarship. And I serve as a professional development mentor at the Job Opportunities Program, a program that focuses on placing inner city high school youths at internships at well-known organizations. So I am proof that philanthropy in the form of a scholarship can easily transform a student's life for the better and provide further evidence that everyone deserves the opportunity to choose their educational journey. So how did philanthropy change my life? It's rather simple. It started with one generous donation that turned into a scholarship. That scholarship, in turn, opened the door for a better educational opportunity. That educational opportunity opened more doors that helped me become a better person and acquire the fundamental tools needed to succeed in our globalized community. Here I am now, a first-generation college graduate who was born and raised in a ghetto, a working professional with a deep appreciation for philanthropy and education, and an understanding of the hard work required to achieve this thing we call the American dream. And most importantly, a burning desire to unlock the potential in our youth who are the future of America so they continue making this nation great. So I say thank you to all of you for your generosity. You all create opportunity and hope for the, all the philanthropic organizations you support. Those organizations, in turn, use your generosity to drive systemic change in our communities. Thank you. Is that not a great story or what? You know, I hope Ted Forsman and John Walton are on our same time zone so they could hear this. And Jason, this is part of what makes this country so great. You have someone who's generous, and then you have someone who's willing to work hard to do something with us. So Jason, congratulations to you. you know. It, it reminds me of that uh, Groucho Marx quote. I mean, I, I knew Jason would be great. When you read his biography, you go, wow. And uh, as Groucho Marx used to say, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Uh, Darla, please stand up and be recognized as the longtime director of the Children's Scholarship Fund. Stand up. <laughs> Be 
because as we all know here, you can have great ideas, and yes, you can have money, but then you got to have somebody who executes the plan. All right, speaking of executing the plan, <laughs> our next speaker is Jack Horner. Jack directs the largest dinosaur field research program in the world in Bozeman, Montana. I'm not quite sure where to start with Jack because he's done so much. Don't. He served his country, as you can see. Jack is his own man. He served his country as a Marine in Vietnam. He's been on 60 Minutes with Leslie Stahl. He's a MacArthur fella. That and you'd rather hear from Jack than you would from me, so I'm going to sit down. <laughs> oh. oh, by the way, did I mention that he's the technical, he was the technical advisor for all of Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park movie? Seriously. Big deal. <laughs> can, can I have the lights off? Please? Please? Pretty please? Whoop. Oh. All right, so, Jason, that was a great story. I, my, I, I can't, I don't have anything like that. I dig up dinosaurs. So, my, my history is a little different. I went to high school, and I passed. And I have a high school diploma. I got in 1964. And then I went to college at the University of Montana because all you had to have was a high school diploma. And so I went for a bunch of years and I flunked out. And I do not have any kind of credentials. I do not have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD, none of that stuff. But I got a job at Princeton University. <laughs> I don't know what that says, but. But anyway, I got a job at Princeton University in 1975, and, and I, was, I was fortunate. I was, I was very fortunate because three years later, now I, I got a job as a technician. That means the lowest position you could have at Princeton University. Which was okay, because I was from Montana, and I was having a hard time adjusting to Princeton anyway. <laughs> so, in 1978, I found some really cool dinosaurs. They were the, turned out to be the first baby dinosaurs found anywhere in the world. And so, that was pretty cool. And so, but I was a technician, and I needed some money. To, so I could go back out and collect some more of these dinosaurs. And so I didn't know anything about writing grants, and I didn't know anybody that had any money. And so, and so I did the one thing that I, the only thing that I could think of doing, I wrote to the Rainier Brewing Company. <laughs> because, because I drank a lot of their beer. <laughs> and, and I asked for $10,000, and, and they actually agreed to give it to me. <laughs> but Princeton University said, there is no way in this world you're going to take money from the Marineer Brewing Company. <laughs> and so they gave me $10,000, Princeton University did, and the Rainier Brewing Company gave us 125 cases of beer. <laughs> And we made furniture. <laughs> so, so after that, Princeton, for some reason, thought that this was not going well. And so, so they, uh, they act, somebody talked to somebody, I think, because the next year, I actually got money from the National Science Foundation. And Princeton University gave me a, a raise. They promoted me from technician to research scientist, which was pretty, pretty cool. So, but I think they did that so they could get money from the National Science Foundation. And so, 
for a few years, a couple of years, I uh, had money from the National Science Foundation. And, uh, and then I ran into this guy who, from Montana, uh, who said they were building a museum in Bozeman, Montana, and they needed a paleontologist. And so, well, they didn't really say that. Really what they said was they wanted the fossils that I was collecting and taking back to Princeton. And I said, the only way they could really have those is if they hired me. And so, and so in 1982, I was hired as a curator of paleontology. I mean, I was getting a lot of promotions in a big hurry with, for a guy that didn't have any degrees of any kind. But they told me I could be a curator of paleontology. Um, and they would pay my salary, but I had to raise all the money for everything else, including exhibits in the museum and, and staff. And they, in other words, they wouldn't pay for anything. And so. I accepted that, and uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I was a curator then. Anyway, so then, anyway, I, I managed to get some more money from the National Science Foundation, and we collected a lot of cool stuff. And what was really cool was we found 10 new species of dinosaurs, and we found more dinosaur eggs, and we found the first dinosaur eggs uh, with embryos in the world. I mean, it was really cool. You know. I love what I do. I just love it. I mean, I just, I love it. I like finding dinosaurs. Um, I didn't really like looking for money. That was not my favorite thing to do. But on the other hand, I really like dinosaurs. And so you have to find some money. And so, as you all know, you have to go out and get it. So in, uh, 1990, I started looking for donors, and I was very fortunate in Montana to find quite a few of them. And, uh, and so, uh, 1993, I actually ran into a woman named Vicki Gray, who is in our audience, and she introduced me to a, a number of people who became very good donors. Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> So by the mid-1990s, I had already, uh, we'd built a program that we had, we had people all over Montana um, collecting dinosaurs from different ages of rock. We were getting all sorts of things. We also uh, were able to get, I, I was actually able to hire an administrative assistant a histologist, three preparators of my own, and uh, 12 graduate students. And as you can see here, the Merck Family Fund was a very big donor um, and a number of other people. But, but I'm greedy. I really wanted more dinosaurs. And, and so, in 1998, I decided that I wanted to have more dinosaurs than anyone had ever collected in history. <laughs> and so I went to the National Science Foundation and asked them for $500,000 for five years. And they said, first off, that's way too much money. We can't give you that much money. But second of all, that's not possible to collect more dinosaurs than anyone's ever collected in history and especially where you want to go look. I wanted to go look in the Hell Creek Formation where Tyrannosaurus rex came from. I wanted to go get some more Tyrannosaurus rex specimens, and I wanted some more Triceratops specimens because it turns out that all of the people who had collected before were at places like Yale University and the American Museum and these kind of places, and they had collected them back in the old days when they forgot the whole, they, they didn't realize they had to have data with them. We had to know where they came from. And so, and so I wanted to go out and get specimens that actually had data associated with them. And so I wanted to do, to do this. And so they said, no. They said, that's not possible. And so, so I did go out and, and I raised some money um, and this is where Vicky probably recognizes everyone on there. 
And uh, Nathan Miravold was the person who came forward and offered to uh, underwrite most of it. And we started that project, the Hell Creek Project. It became the largest paleontologic expedition in history. And, uh, and we were, because we had funding, we had a helicopter, we could go anywhere, we, could, we had boats, we had every kind of equipment you could possibly imagine. We were able to get dinosaurs out of places that no one had ever been able to get them before. And as a result, we ended up with a whole bunch of new, new Tyrannosaurus rex specimens. I don't know if you remember that the Field Museum not too long ago bought a Tyrannosaurus rex for $8.35 million. And for 850,000, we collected eight Tyrannosaurus rex skeletons. And we got a bunch of Triceratops skeletons and a whole bunch of other stuff and, and it really, you know, it's one of the, it is one of the largest dinosaur collections ever made in the United States. And so that was pretty cool. But at the same time, we, uh, we got um, the Charlotte and Walter Kohler Charitable Trust to give us enough money to build a laboratory so that we could not only collect these, not only study them, but to look inside of them. So now what we want to do is take the bones and cut them open and actually look inside and learn something about their growth and their behavior, something no one had ever done before. Because of course, who would want to cut open a bone? They're precious. Well, there's more, inf more information inside than there is outside, so we started cutting up bones, and bones are really cool inside. These are all dinosaur bones. These tell us how dinosaurs grow. And you can determine their age, their growth rate, their physiology, all sorts of things about an animal by looking inside of the bones. And so that's what we were doing. Anyway, we still do that. We have a histology lab that is just great. And then, in, and then we, we sort of ran out of that fund, and then we went to the Smithsonian and uh, Smithsonian wanted a T-Rex of their own, and they didn't have any, and I had a bunch. <laughs> and I told them that if they put a million dollars into my research fund that I would go find them one. And so they went out and found a donor, and I don't know who that donor is. Some of you might know who that was. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, we got a million dollars, and, and then we went out and found the Smithsonian a Tyrannosaurus rex. And we got a whole bunch of Triceratopses for us. In fact, we found more than a hundred Triceratops specimens. A hundred skeletons of Triceratops. Turned out to have, we found baby Triceratopses. No one had ever seen a baby Triceratops before because, well, they're little and everybody in the old days, like at Yale and <laughs> the American Museum, wanted big dinosaurs in their museums. And so they forgot to collect the little ones. So I have a little museum, we have little dinosaurs. It's okay. <laughs> in 2006, we also had a great donation from Tom and Stacy Siebel, and we built our new dinosaur hall, which if you ever get a chance, you should come see. It is one of the best dinosaur halls in America, I assure you. And it's loaded in Bozeman, Montana. Bozeman, Montana. Bozeman, not very far, it's just north of here. <laughs> Go see it. All right. And unfortunately, I filled up the museum, and so it's full now. And uh, that seems to be our problem right now, is we don't have anywhere to put anything. So, so I decided we'd have a project in other countries. So we're now going out and collecting dinosaurs for other countries including Mongolia, Romania, South America, you know, we're, we're, we're doing all sorts of things. And we're also working on something called the Preservation Project that uh, Nathan Miravold put some money up for. And this is our attempt to get DNA out of a dinosaur. I was, I did work on Jurassic Park. They had DNA. I figured I could get some too. Uh, <laughs> turns out that unfortunately you can't get it out of an insect. Uh, and so we tried to get it out of dinosaurs. We did get proteins. We got collagen, keratin, 
and we even got heme from hemoglobin, but no DNA. So we're still working on that. We built a laboratory that we could actually take to the field so that we could get it fresh. And unfortunately, um, we got better samples of proteins, but DNA just doesn't last long enough. And then, more recently, George Lucas came to us and gave us $1 million. And he gave it to us unrestricted. And he said, Jack, you can do anything you want with it. And so I decided to do something different. I started the Dino Chicken Project. <laughs> I can't clone a dinosaur, so now I'm going to retro-engineer one. And that's the whole notion. The whole idea is that dinosaurs gave rise to birds. And so can we reverse evolution and actually get the characteristics back? We are trying to do that in our laboratory in Montana and another laboratory at McGill University in Montreal. We are stimulating genes, and, and we are discovering how animals grow and how they develop. And we expect that in the not too distant future, we will go from having a chicken to a chickenosaurus. <laughs> so I want to thank all of these people, the people who have been generous enough to uh, donate lots of, our, of money for us to do all these wild and crazy things. But we are learning a great deal about dinosaurs. We are also learning a great deal about the kinds of things that will help us humans in the future and impact medical science if we can actually add a tail to a chicken. Thank you very much. I knew Jack would be great. Just This is a true story. Sheer coincidence, my wife Kelly and I were in Jackson Hole last uh, Saturday night, and there was a science program of, in downtown in Jackson, Metro Jackson. And uh, we went to it, and Jack was speaking. And he absolutely captivated the audience. The, there was an 11-year-old who asked a question, and I didn't hear the question. But it was, it was a disappointing kind of like, well, didn't you find something here? And, and Jack said, how old are you? And he said, this voice on the balcony, I'm 11 years old. And Jack's response was, yeah, I get a lot of hate mail from 11-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, thank you. Vicki, would you stand up and be recognized? I don't... I don't uh, I don't know anything about you, but if you've been helpful to Jack, Jack is great, so you must be great. So thank you so much. Speaking of great, our final speaker is Brent Adams. Brent is the Director of Animation and Professor at Brigham Young University. His life does not begin to reflect his accomplishments. Trained as an architect, but with an interest in computer graphics, Brent created from scratch a multidisciplinary program within a university, a model envied by all. Don't take my word for it. Here's what the New York Times said last year. When Hollywood wants good, clean fun, it goes to Mormon country. Please welcome Brent Adams.
Yes, Mom! <laughs> Life gets more fun with a bigger gun. I will feast on your soul. Ready. Fight. This guy is spring fresh newbie. Oh well. <laughs> Somebody stepped up their game. It's about time. Hidden power unlocked. Hidden powers? Super combo. All right, now it's on. No. Obliterated. That's not true. <laughs> That's impossible. No! He showed mercy. Oh, I'm free at last! I'm reborn! I'm gonna eat vegetables! I'm gonna adopt puppies! I'm gonna build a school! And I'm gonna fill that school with puppies! I'm gonna save a whale! I'm gonna ride a whale! I'm gonna win an Oscar! I'm gonna ride that whale to the Oscars. I'm gonna be Jennifer Lawrence. I'm gonna marry Jennifer Lawrence. I'm gonna ride a whale with Jennifer Lawrence. I wanted to set the right mood. Um, Cause the rest of it for a few minutes is gonna be really boring. Um, I do wanna thank you for uh, letting me do this. Uh, the two most favorite things I do is to brag about my students and to thank people who make a lot of sacrifice to help other people. And I know I'm not gonna make it through this talk. Um, um, I just, there's a couple of things. We had a nice dinner, appreciate that. Hope you brought your sleeping bags. Um, Cause my classes run two, three hours and, um, and Lindsay and Amanda and other staff are freaking out right now. Cause, cause Amanda and Lindsay had to hear me one time and I went on and on for like two hours, so. Um, Basically, what I want to talk really about is the difference donors have made. As I go through the steps of what we're doing, you'll start to see that everything we do is totally impossible without a lot of people making sacrifice and helping us out. 
I wanted to show the film because I wanted to put it in context of how difficult it is to do this. Um, when Pixar or Disney uh, make a five minute animated short film, um, they budget anywhere from one and a half to two million dollars to make that five minute short film. So when you're watching a movie like Frozen or Jurassic Park or those, it's about a million and a half or two million dollars for every running minute of the movie. So it's very, very expensive. It's very, very time consuming. Uh, Pixar, like I said, it takes them about a year to make a short film once they, they green light the idea. Um, 20, 25 people on it, a um, million and a half dollars. The fact that we're doing things, it's not Pixar quality, um, but the fact that we're doing with mostly undergraduate students at a university who have to also go to math and English and history classes at BYU, <laughs> they're gonna be in religion classes on top of that. Um, several of our students are already married, they have family responsibilities, and most of them are trying to put themselves through school and so they have part-time jobs. Um, I also want to thank the round table because in, I think it was the summer of 2011, you did an article on our main donor named Ira Fulton. And I was interviewed and talked about what he does. He had a goal of giving a billion dollars to education. Um, and then the economy went bad. Um, and so he, he just, you know, he's not able to do what he did, but he's given uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but the very last thing in that article, which is such a great article, is that he was asked, of all these things you donate, what's your favorite thing to donate to? And he says, of all the things I donate to, everything is my favorite, or I wouldn't donate to it. And then he says, but animation is my favorite favorite. <laughs> and I have got more mileage at the university out of that quote. Um, so uh, again, my, my background's architecture, computer graphics, I was teaching, uh, um, Actually, I was teaching transportation design and product design classes. We had a lot of students who would come and say, you know, I really, um, I, I think I want to go into entertainment. I want to go make movies. And it was it's similar skills, similar software, similar skills. You got to draw, you got to think. Um, and some of them were actually getting jobs out in the industry. And there was a lot more and more pressure for us to create an animation major, um, but at a university where we don't have those kind of resources. and. Um, and we looked around and it's okay, if we did this, you know, who's, who are the great schools? Um, for the most part, they're all private animation schools. There's a private animation school in California. They currently have 2,100 animation majors at $30,000 uh, a year. Um, and they, the school has a private jet that they go around and pick up people if they need them to host or they need a wine and dine, they have a private jet. Well, we had the president of Pixar come and speak at our university, flew into, Salt Lake on Southwest Airlines got his own rental car, came down and spoke, and we got him lunch. Um, <laughs> we, you know, so, but we go, we can, how do we compete with that? Because we are, our students are in math and English and history and religion. It's just going to be hard to, um, to, compete, with, to compete with that. Um, and so I went out to former students, and I said, look, what would the curriculum be? You, you were a student at BYU, or, or, you know, I knew other people. What could you do? And they said, okay, it needs to be this and this and this. Well, it's interesting, as soon as the, the, the studios found out, I was trying to find out what a curriculum would be, doors opened up to higher and higher executives. Um, they were interested, like a school wants to know, <laughs> asking us what we think a curriculum ought to be. And so um, I went and visited Pixar. A friend of mine was working at Pixar. I went there, and, and I'm on this tour, and I'm talking to a few people, and all of a sudden they take me around the corner. Here's Ed Catmull's office. He's the president and kind of the founder of Pixar. So I thanked him for making nice movies that made they had made Toy Story is all, and they were working on Bugs Life um, when I first went and visited with him. Um, and, and I said, you know, we're trying to do this and all that stuff, and I thanked him, and I got to leave, and he says, are you in a hurry? And I said, no, but I'm sure you are. And he said, I scheduled an hour for you to talk to you about what education should be, and we saw it more and more. And then we'd ask, hey, what do you want to, what should it be? And it's interesting because more and more I was hearing, Disney told me, he said, we're looking for a computer science person who can draw, or an artist who can do some code. And, and I said, do you get any of those? There's almost none <laughs> who can do that. And I'm going, we get really smart artists at our university. The average high school GPA in our starting freshman this year, I checked before I came, um, the, their average high school GPA was 3.8. 20% .8. Um, of the starting freshmen at BYU this year graduated in the top 5%, not 5%, the top five in their high school. 
Um, we don't get really great artists at BYU. We get really smart ones. And I thought, wow. So I thought this thing that was going to be a problem all of a sudden started to not be a problem. And, it, and I thought, ooh, this is, you know. They, they always talk about thinking outside of the box. Well, it's, no, think about inside the box. What are your constraints? What are your, and I understand think outside your box. I was an architect. But what are your constraints? And how do you work inside of those constraints? And so but now I'm hearing you might be able to do this because we're looking for smart artists. Talk to Ed Catmull again, and he said, so here's another thing you should think about. He said, we can't find people that can collaborate. Um, we can't find people that understand interdisciplinary nature. And I'm thinking, yeah, when I was an architect, some of the best designers in our um, firm never got invited to anything, never had any input because they didn't know how to collaborate. They hadn't been taught how to collaborate. And you're going, it's such a shame. And, and, and Dr. Catmull said, if you can create a thing, it's interdisciplinary collaborative. And I'm going, well, we're going to have to because no one department is going to allow me to create a whole new department. You know? And so we're going to have to steal a little bit here, steal a little bit there. Um, but the other thing that was happening, and the thing that kind of was um, surprising to me is I went to a head of HR at a major studio, and I said, OK, you've hired one of my students. We're looking at curriculum. What should it be? And she, she got really nervous, and she looks around in her office, head of HR. She gets up, closes the door to her office, and she says, uh, will you please make sure your students keep taking religion classes? And I, I what? You know, I mean, they're going to because it's BYU. But <laughs> and she said, we don't want you to come here and make us all Mormons. <laughs> we're okay with our religion. But this industry attracts creeps, and we're tired of creeps. And we're tired of working with creeps, and creeps make creepy movies. And then she opened the door, and then we taught curriculum. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, and then. Um, I was, so we got started, and I'm still a little nervous about the take your religion kind of thing and religion classes and all that stuff and make a big deal of it because I'm thinking we got to go out and work at Pixar. Um, an Orthodox Jew that was vice president of Sony, we were talking one time about religion, and he said, do you ever get to talk to your students about religion? I go, it's BYU, remember? <laughs> we, you know, we do that. And uh, he says, um, do you think it would be OK if I came and talked to your students about religion? And I said, absolutely. It would be awesome. So, so he came, um, an Orthodox Jew, who, who walks to, um, to, to um, his synagogue on the Sabbath, because he's that Orthodox. And, and so he had three, 400 film animation students at BYU. And he talked about the evils. There's good and bad, there's evil. You absolutely need to take your morals to Hollywood, and, and we need to fight this thing. And then just a little while later, we had the head of recruiting at um, another studio that's born again Christian. And she asked me if she could come and talk. And she's come a couple of times. So we're hearing these kinds of things and stuff. And so it starts to really start to form our, our program. We created this interdisciplinary program. Um, we have one faculty in the film department, two in the art department, two of us in computer science. I'm in computer science. I start in art. After I steal all the resources, I move and run to another, another department. But Ira Fulton came to me and said, what do you need at the university here? And I said, we need computing power. And um, I told him what we needed. And, and we needed a couple of million dollars. And we did it. And I said, it's not just for animation. It's for the university. There's things that we just can't do. So we got the computer. Um, and what's really great about Ira Fulton, he just doesn't give you money, and he does not donate. He invests, and he always tells you to invest, and he always comes back and checks on you. And he always wants to be a face that people can understand that this is not free money, that there's somebody behind here that's checking up on you, which is spectacular. And I suggest that, if possible, you do that. He came back a few weeks after he got it started up. He says, isn't anybody using it? And I said, I said it's full. And, I, and he started yelling at me. <laughs> You said it was going to be an Im impact. I says, the company we bought it from sent me a letter telling me that we we're buying too big. And they wanted to go on record saying you're overbought. And we've had it three weeks, and it's full. And so he continued to, to put more in, and more into it. So interdisciplinary, we have the technology. And very, very interdisciplinary collaborative. So the students pitch an idea for a film every year. Um, and then they vote on it. So it's very, very democratic. They vote. Then they choose the director, and then they choose the producer, and then they start talking about who's a technical lead. So we have these students from all these departments working together on these things. So when I was moving from engineering college to computer science, um, 
It's like, okay, we've been pretty successful. This is like a year and a half ago. And, um, and now, but we're going to move to a department where it's a better fit. And they said, okay, we're computer science. We've got all these computers, all that stuff. And so we started remodeling the space for it and everything. And about, uh, so we were going to move and had all the classes scheduled to start in January. And engineering was going to take over our space. I already had some classes scheduled. And about the first week of November, the university and computer science came and says, you know, we, we realize we don't have any computers for you. And I says, well, I just got a bid from Mulet Packard for $100,000. And they says, well, sorry, we really don't have it. So I don't know what you're going to do for next semester. And here's some old computers. And you go, we can't do this on old computers. Um, and I wasn't sleeping for a couple of nights, knowing that I'd made this commitment. We were going to go do this thing. And I get to this, I'm in my office. and I'm. I'm in my office not doing anything, and knock on the door, this guy comes in, he's from Houston, and he said, um, I'm here interviewing some students, I have this big company in Houston, and we do air conditioning, um, and my wife and I are talking, and is there something that we can help the animation program out with? <laughs> and I said, $1,000 allows me to hire a student for a month. Um, the university has approved I can raise $5 million for an endowment, which we haven't done. He says, I can't do that, and I got more than $1,000. He says, what do you need? And I literally had the quote on my desk. I turned it around and slid it to him. And I said, this is keeping me awake at night. I said, oh, we can do that. Um, so the, the thing is, so not only is that, but here's the thing. I'm moving to a new department. I'm stealing space from them. They gave me four of their computer labs, and our students graduate from the fine art department. So they, don't even, they wouldn't even get to count our students. They're giving the space up to us. And I think the other faculty in this department, there's a couple that want us over here, but there's other faculty that are going to know that we're just stealing. And if we would have got those computers that I thought we were going to get from them, then it, they could have always held it over my head, and that would have put huge barriers. But now I get this money from a donor. And so now all of a sudden everybody's fine and that's just another thing that's making this miracle happen with this interdisciplinary thing is the sources is not, are not coming from places where anybody could hold over your head and say, okay, this is what we're doing. Okay, so what we're trying to do with education, we are really trying to mess up education. Um, I, I hated school as a student. I absolutely hated everything about it. What I hated about it was I hated that the teacher knew the answer and all of my education was to try and find that answer. And I go, I want to find my own answer, and I want to ask my own questions. And, and it just drove me crazy for years and years and years. And I was kind of like Jack. I was in school. I was out of school. And I was in school. It took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree because I hated school. And, um, but I knew it was important, so I, st I stuck it out. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, um, uh, when I became an educator, Friends found out I was an educator now. And they go, no, you, you, you didn't make it through school. Um, but um, the seniors that work on these films, I give one assignment. It's a two year, it's a, it's a full year thing, two semesters, I give them one assignment, make a film. And we have major donors who get involved in terms of finances, we, you know, things like that, but we also have people who donate time and mentors from industry. The students email me their grade at the end of the semester, and that's the grade they get. And the only grades I change are the ones, my best students always say I get an A minus, because they always know what, what, they're, what they're weak in. Um, and then I always give them a better grade. But I never give a worse grade. Sometimes I'll send an email and say, I know, and you know, <laughs> that you didn't deserve that, because I know that will haunt them forever, but I give them that grade anyway. <laughs> so what are the successes of the program? Um, the Television Academy um, every year honors three student films with a student um, Emmy. The Motion Picture Academy also every year honors um, three um, films with the Student Academy Awards. In about the 10 years we've been playing, we've won 16 student Emmys. And, <laughs> and, and we've won five Student um, Academy Awards. The own film that you saw, we just barely finished it. Um, it won first place Student Emmy and first place Student Academy Award. And as far as we can tell from those two academies, this is the first time a film has ever won first place in both of them. The student who directed it um, starts at Pixar in three weeks. The girl who was responsible for all the hair and stuff on the characters, she, she started at Sony a month ago. Um, major, major studios and, and, and major, major um, kind of thing. Our films are played at the Cannes Film Festival, they play at Sundance, they play around the world. 
Um, it played at a festival that Nickelodeon had one of our films. Um, they had 4,700 films submitted. They accepted 29, and we won um, the two top prizes. And it wasn't a student contest. Um, yesterday, I was with Ira Fulton. He came to campus, and I was with a gentleman named Jack Wheatley. And I know Jack Wheatley has attended these meetings several times. They were on campus. Um, and, and Ira had made a commitment, because they're trying to build a new engineering building. And Ira's made a commitment, could all these students gather around, engineering students and our animation students, anybody's helping. And he said, I will match a million dollars. If you put in a dollar, I'll put in a dollar, up to a million dollars. He didn't have to come and do that. Um, and then Stan Bickman, the one who gave us the, mich the, the money for the computers, he said, I, I want an anonymous donation. And I said, please don't do that. And he says, no, I, really, I, don't, I just don't need it. I don't want it. I don't, and I says, I know you don't want people calling you and all that stuff, but please don't be an anonymous donor. I said, I need my students to put a face. I don't want my students to think this is free money. Because if it's free money, that gives them no obligation. I need them to see a face. I need them to know it's not free. They're starting, they're starting to understand. I was in a meeting and, and in my new college, a new dean, and he's talking about this student he says, I just want you to know what students are doing. He says, there's a student that was here on scholarship. Um, he was also works as a research assistant, and he just sent a check back. He's been out in the industry for three, um, three years, and um, he just sent the um, check back, completely paying back all of his scholarship and all of his TA money, and said, um, I'll never get even, but this is a start. And um, they asked who his name was, and they said, it's Daniel Adams. <laughs> and um, I call up my son, and I said, um, why did you do that? And he said, because um, I've been around you, and you're always talking about donors, and I know Ira, and, um, and I need to learn how to do this. Um, so, um, So other successes, um, if you've seen Frozen, the, the animation of the um, snowman was done by Hiram Osman. He was a student of mine. And yes, he's Donnie Marie's nephew. Um, uh, we have a student on Brave. He's responsible for all of the cloth simulation. And so, so Pixar only officially mentors two programs, um, CalArts, which is an animation school that Walt Disney started, and they mentor us. They send four or five people out to our school every semester. They spend three or four days there working one-on-one -on -one with the students. Um, other stu schools, or other studios starting to do that. We got a phone call in the spring from Blizzard. They're a major game company, and they said, we understand that Pixar you know, mentors your program. They do. Is that exclusive? And I go, what do you mean exclusive? Well, we want to do the same thing. It's just a phone call out of the blue. Well, about a month and a half later, we get this phone call from the assistant to the president of Nickelodeon. Um, tell us about your um, uh, mentoring opportunities. And you know, what are you talking about? We, you know, we asked the mentors. And they said, what is your relationship with television and all that stuff? I said, most of our students go to the games or, or, or movies. We almost no one to television. Come and talk to us. So we, a couple of us went out there. And they said, we want to mentor your program. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, we want to help you develop an entire curriculum on writing for television. Um, and we've started that, and we've started to incorporate. And I said, why yes? And they said, we want your kind of, um, your, your students with that background, the interdisciplinary, the collaborative, but also this sense of, of needing to help society become better. And we need you um, to help write our, our television programs. And if you know SpongeBob and some of these other ones, which I don't know much about anyway, it's just the one donor, one thing, just like you. They just build on, build on, doors open up, and same with Jason, just one on one on one. It's amazing. A year ago, I get a, a, a phone call from um, a writer from the New York Times. And he said, we want to come and at least see if we can do a story on your program. I go, you, I said, you don't want to do an article on our program. He says, why not? I said, we're a tiny little program in the middle of Utah. Um, there's big animation schools all over the place. And he says, no, we want to come. I says, why? He says, I'll tell you when I get there. So he came out. I says, so why do you want to come? He says, there's two things we're interested in, and neither one of them are worth of, worthy of a story. And I go, well, that doesn't tell me anything. Because <laughs> he says, we're interested because you're successful and you're in Utah, and why are you not in New York or, or California? And he says, the other thing is, is that you're not shy in telling people that you want your students to go out and create entertainment that builds up society and doesn't tear it down. 
And he says, lots of people say that. But the fact that you're successful and the studios are hiring the very students that you've sent out there to change them, um, we found that fascinating. So they wrote this article. Um, and when they were writing, I wasn't sure if they were just going to make us look goofy. Um, and, and anyway, um, this is what, um, what the writer said through this whole thing. And he kept talking about students. And he kept them telling them, you know, we just want to go out and make entertainment better and make it at least something that we can watch and uplifting. This is what the, the, the writer said. He said, I kept being reminded that BYU's program was only 13 years old. Most of the moral emissaries that had been pouring into industry are still climbing to the positions from which they'll be able to truly influence a film's tone and content. When the article came out, my wife came in and said, Brent, your phone's broken. What do you mean it's broken? Did you drop it? <laughs> it's an iPhone. I thought it had broken it. Um, she says, no, it just keeps buzzing. And, and this was, I knew the article was coming out on a Sunday, but this was on a Thursday. I didn't know it was coming out early online, uh, in, you know, online. And anyway, I was getting three and four emails every single minute. The phone just literally sat and vibrated for about four days. Um, and my email is not in the article, nor is my phone number. People had to go in, BYU, find the name, make, make the effort to do this. They were from all walks of life, um, hoping that, that um, you know, we were successful. I got one that was very, very interesting, and it means the most to me, probably, of all, and said, um, I want you to know I'm not a fan of BYU, and I'm not a fan of the Mormon church. Um, I'm male, I'm 37, I'm gay, um, I'm Democrat. And I go, the Democrat's okay. No, I mean, <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, I thought he was going to blast us. I thought he was going to go, you guys are goofballs, you're stupid. Who do you think you are? Um, he said, I pray for your success. Um, I hope you have legions of students um, that can go out. And, and we know that, um, that, that entertainment is um, getting worse and worse and worse. And, um, and we need something else. Vice President Sony um, said this about our program. BYU's existing program and vision for the future puts it into an elite group of international educational programs that are defining the next generation of animation and computer graphics educators and professionals. Ed, um, Ed Catmull, who's the president of Pixar, but he's also the president of Disney Animation, so he's probably the most influential person in, in the world in the animation industry, said this about BYU. He said, one of the interesting things is all of a sudden, in the last few years, we found that BYU has risen to the top. It is amazing to suddenly see that BYU is producing the best in the industry. It's the perception not just at Pixar, but also at the other studios is something pre pretty remarkable is happening. Um, so I want to summarize. Um, we do not exist without the donors who have helped us out um, with equipment, with money that I can hire students so they aren't selling shoes or changing light bulbs on campus. Um, and um, and um, the fact that, that the equipment came and there's an issue who owns it and who gets to use it. Um, without it, this whole program doesn't exist. Where are we going? Um, the university announced to me this week that they're reorganizing the art department to make it so that more collaborative, interdisciplinary things can happen across campus. And, um, and again, the university said we can start to raise a $5 million um, endowment. And um, um, uh, we just hired a new professor from the, from the gaming industry. Where, where does it take us? I don't know. I didn't know when we created it, where we would go. I didn't know when I moved to computer science that it would, it would continue to, um, to increase. The, the reason why that film won those awards is because um, we have so many computer science students and all this stuff, and it's, it's, it's truly amazing. So we're going to finish with one more, one more film. Um, it's by far the most requested film we've done. It also won a Student Emmy and a Student Academy Award. I want to really put this thing into a context. When I go out to film festivals, even to the Emmys and the Academy Awards, uh, I know I'm pretty conservative. Um, there are films that students are making that I will not sit and watch because I don't need that imprint, imprinted in my brain. We're watching a film at one of the student Emmys. It wasn't an animated film, but it was a film. And, and I get up and I, I walk out. I'm out in the lobby. And pretty soon, my students are out there, and other students started coming out there. 
And pretty soon the president of the foundation um, came out, and he's out in the, in the lobby. And then the president of the um, television academy came out, and we're talking. And um, I said, so why are you out here? And he said, I don't want to see that. And I said, so why are you rewarding students who do that? And he said, I don't know, but we're going to change. Um, so, but it happens a lot because students, they're taught to be edgy and they want to do sex and violence. They want to do alcohol and smoking and I'm not saying those are bad and that's, a, you know, I'm just not saying they're bad, but, but it's always to the extreme. Everything about it is always to the extreme. And so my students pitch their own stories. I help them make them. And, and this next film, I've got hundreds and hundreds of letters, probably thousands of letters and emails from around the world um, telling me how much this film has impacted them, how much has changed them, how it's made them think. Um, as you watch it, it was hard, this is the hardest film for me to make because it's about a little boy dealing with the death of his grandfather, and the whole time we're making it, my father-in-law's on life support. Um, and, we, and, and the family came to me and said, we can't decide to keep him or do we turn it off? And so you're at the in-law, so you have to decide. Um, but I want you to watch this and understand that, um, that because of help of donors, and I appreciate what you do across the board, um, things like this are able to happen. And, and so we're gonna watch it, I'm done. Um, when it's done, we're done. But um, I just wanted to thank each of you for what you do.